hospitality, hotel business since I was two years old. So I've seen a lot of changes. Whenever I was growing up, we never had any problems with crime on our streets. We ran around on the beach all day long, and our parents didn't have to worry about us. This day and age, it's not the same. We have to be very proactive in watching our kids and everything else that goes on around us. And we shouldn't have to do that. We should be a more family-friendly environment. And so our public safety is the number one issue right now. And I just need to, um, have to excuse me, it's been a long day. But we need to bring back our family-friendly beach. And uh, I would appreciate your vote number for seven. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Keith Van Winkle. Uh, I'd like to thank the South Strand Republican Club for hosting this event once again for each and every one of you here tonight. I would ask that you take a look up on this stage and see who's here tonight and who's not here tonight. The incumbents are not here tonight. And they each sent out an email identical stating why they wouldn't be here because they have prior obligations of meet and greet with the identical email. Same word. Ladies and gentlemen, they've been hiding from you. The voter, when you don't have a record to run on, you have to hide. We're up here because we have a common ground, an interest, and that is to serve the public. We see the need of what's taking place in our city, the violent crime that has taken place is on the rise and it's been going since 2008. I grew up here in Murray County. I'm a graduate from Moore, um, Conway High School and I know a little bit about service. I led a life as a missionary in my young adult. I served in Haiti. I served in the Philippines. I've been in Russia. I know what it means to get down in the trenches of life and serve people who are poor and oppressed and who have no voice. The bottom line is this, this election is about public safety. And I'm asking you to please, don't be fooled by the scare tactics that you're getting in the mail. If you vote for somebody other than the incumbents, your property taxes are gonna increase 400%. That is a lie, ladies and gentlemen. It's not true, so I'm asking you to put public safety first. It's about the direction of what kind of city we want to live in in the 21st century. What kind of city do we want our children and grandchildren to live in? My name is Keith Van Winkle, and I would humbly ask for your vote on November 7th. Thank you, and God bless. Um, I want to thank Mr. Van Winkle. Uh, I was going to uh, mention uh, that uh, Mr. Randall Wallace and Mr. Mike Lowder uh, did send me an email this morning at around 10, 10.30 to 10.40, uh, 50, that said they would not be here. Greg Smith did tell me he would not be here a week ago, so he's at a function somewhere here in the Market Commons, but he's welcome to come over since he gets to that. So those, those uh, income from us. Thank you. Uh, let's get to uh, public safety. Um, uh, Mr. Van Winkle just mentioned that. Um, my, the question is, the Myrtle Beach Police Department and City Council just unveiled, unveiled a seven-year plan to bring on seven officers a year for seven years. I would like each candidate to give me a critique of this plan, and do you think it will be a failure or success? And who wants to get first? Um, from the start, I think it's going to be a failure because it's not going to keep up with the uh, increase in crime if we don't get boots on the ground immediately. So, seven years, seven there, over the next seven years. Sounds like a good plan, but unless we start clearing our streets of 
you know, people are going to look at that and for this to clear the homeless, to clear the vacancy, the drug users, the people sleeping in our bushes, behind our buildings, behind our businesses. We're not going to get anywhere. So I think we actually really need to increase law enforcement today and get them into the communities, on the back streets, and a seven-year plan is not going to keep up with Ray if we don't get out ahead of what's already been occurring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have two minutes and 30 seconds to answer the question. Oh. I believe that this plan is uh, set up to fail. 70 officers in seven years, that's not actually completely accurate because it's only, I think, 56 officers in seven years. They're not all uniformed officers on the street. But let's take an area like Harvard Commons itself, for example. Nothing but growth. A lot of growth is taking place here. The plan that they have created doesn't even accommodate our growth, our future growth. So, as time goes on, we're going to be out of officers again. In seven years, we're not going to be able to keep up with what's going on. So no, the plan doesn't work. The magic number, I don't know. We need an hour, we don't have time to wait. I'd like to see 70 officers in one year. That would be the best option, not in seven years. I've been told to keep it simple. My files are right back there. I could go get my files. I have a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that our police chief gave. And in it, I was interested to see it tells about our average daily population of 155,000. And then on the next page, it indicates how many swarm officers per thousand people you need, according to authorities. So I thought, okay, the next page is going to say what our plan is to meet that. So I turned the page because I really thought, well, here's a plan, maybe things will change and, and I can be encouraged. But sadly, the next page was about something else completely different. Toward the end of the presentation, then it went over the plan as far as hiring the number of people. Well, the problem is, just like they said, they're gearing up to meet the average daily population over seven years. So, folks, it's not going to change anytime soon. The Maryland Fried Chicken was just dropped. This is going to keep going on and on, and it's going to come out to market common. The overriding problem, and we can talk about this problem as a crime problem, but the, how did it develop? Let's take a step back. What caused it? The cause is the desire to put heads on bids over spending the money for safety. And we've just got to change because that, that's just very worrisome. So we need to put the money into things instead. Our deficit for the um, convention center and for the ball field combined, that deficit this coming year is over a million dollars. Our interest on our debt is over $7 million. If we get our finances in order and we look for savings, we can pay for the officers we need right now. The police department and public safety certainly has become a big package. And a package is exactly what it is. It's a whole presentation to the community as well as the tourists and the people that view our city. The main thing wrong with the city plan that we have at the moment is, I believe you have to have a psychological term. Somewhere in here we have to make a statement to the public, to our tourists, and to the community that we've made a change that's going to be significant enough that everyone's going to see it as well as the, the law-abiding citizens, as well as those that are not law-abiding and those that intend to come here and cause us trouble. We haven't done that. Seven officers is a drop in the bucket. That won't mean a thing. We know we all lose three to four officers a year to retirement and going to other locations to be policemen. There's, it's not going to matter. We have to do something different. In order to do something different, it's going to take money. And in order to do that, we have to generate some income to do it. Our city's budget 
is exactly perfectly balanced just like it is. The money that leaves our city in this 1% chamber money does not come back. We lose about 60% of that money. It's sent to Columbia and it's gone. That money was sucked off of the city. Those were the money we needed for policemen. We needed for roads. We needed for trash trucks. We needed for public services. Well, now we have a shortage of public services and we have to make them up one way or the other. A psychological turn has to be made in order to save 2018. And that's my purpose and my goal. Thank you. I really think that our, our police chief made a good attempt of putting a plan together. Is it complete? Is it spot on what we need right now? Maybe not. We do need to hire more officers. We need to retain the officers we have now. And with that, we're going to have to come up with the money somehow to pay these officers. As everybody knows, we can only turn out so many officers per year out of the state, out of the academy, and each city is only designated so many officers. Well, that's not, in our case, that's not adequate. We need more officers, and they cannot churn them out fast enough to get them to our city. I would love if we can talk with our legislators and get on, on board with the cities on the east coast of South Carolina and start another academy on the east coast here. That would actually filter into all different cities because every one of these guys up here on the east coast of South Carolina have the same problems. They're short of officers. And I think that's the only way that we're going to be able to um, meet the demand. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the city is 56 officers short as of right now. They propose a seven officer plan each year over the next seven years. So if you're 56 short now, and you've got 18 million visitors according to the chamber, let's project seven years down the road. How is that going to add up? Ladies and gentlemen, it's not working. I stand, and some may not like this, but I stand with Mark McBride on this. We need 100 new officers on the streets. We need to pay them what they deserve, a, a fair wage. There's, we don't need to hire people and send them to the academy. If you're going, if you got a problem, you're going to go to the best surgeon. You don't want a rookie. You want to go to the best surgeon. So what do you do? You go outside of the scope and you pay. You pay veteran officers from other states who wouldn't want to love to live in Myrtle Beach. I mean, it's, ladies and gentlemen, it's not rocket science. We've got the money to pay for these officers. The money's there. We don't have, we don't have a budget problem. We've got a management problem. And we have priority problems within the management of the city. We can do better. We must do better. The, the city and the future of our city depends that we do better. Our best days are still yet to come if we get public safety right. And, and, and as Matthew and, and Mike said, we've got a public perception problem worldwide now. After that viral video went to everybody, there's a perception throughout the world that Myrtle Beach is a crime-ridden city, and that's the facts. And there's not enough money that the chamber can gather up to defeat that. So when you go to the polls, I'm asking you again, please, put public safety first. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question from a uh, member of the audience, and I'm going to add to this question because the Municipal Association of South Carolina I just went to a uh, seminar on public safety, and uh, one of the things that was talked about was police officers need a pay raise. 
Uh, it was discussed by every city, uh, and we had three different police chiefs that talked about it. And um, so, Mr. Fickle, Fickle also said that he feels our police officers need a pay raise. And what is your thought on our police force? And I'm going to end it up. What vehicles do you suggest we use to reduce crime? in downtown Myrtle Beach. If you read the news last night, we uh, Maryland Fried Chicken was robbed and a man was stabbed. And then just last week, uh, they arrested Frederick Cowboy Augustine for all kinds of drugs. $100,000 uh, in drugs and $14,000 in cash. So could I, I need somebody to speak on that. Uh, I do believe our police get made too I think 51 is a good start as Somewhere around there, between 47 and 51 in that area. That's average salary. I think that's a good way to do it. I think state troopers started out in the state at 46 and somewhere in that area. Now, what was the second part of that question? Pardon me? What was the second part? The three part? Um, what are your thoughts on our police force and what vehicles do you suggest to reduce crime in downtown Low Beach? I think our police force is trying hard. We need more police officers, clearly. That's become very clear. We need to just make sure you're a proactive police force. I want to go back to the presence of the community policing that ability because that's how police officers get a relationship with people in their community. They get to know them, and everything works out like that. When there's a drug deal in a certain community, the police officer probably already knows who did When there's somebody that's playing in drugs, the police officer probably already knows who's doing it. That's what I want to get back to. And the downtown area, we need to get some surveillance. Right, we've got all these nice cameras all around the place, but there's nobody that watches. They just go back and look at them after the fact, after a crime has taken place. We need to make sure people in the high dense areas. So here in the um, Ocean Boulevard with Scottwood, is. somebody should constantly be watching the cameras in that area. Somebody should constantly be watching the cameras in, anywhere around the city where these sorts of places or these sorts of things are taking place in these high density urban areas. That's all. I'd like to see that we pay the highest rate in our region so we can really attract people. We have such a problem right now. We're in a hole, so we've got to try to dig ourselves out. And looking at the actual plan, again, I have that back there if you want to look at it after the meeting, the PowerPoint presentation, you'll see that the patrols have been extended down to the south end. I, I think that's why they came up with the 15th Avenue South drug bus because they're actually putting people down there now. But when you look at the plan, you'll also see that their patrols are not extending west of 17. So that means that in Brook T. Washington area, then of the states, um, other areas, even up on the north end where a fellow told me on Haskell Circle where we used to have a house, that in a park there, there's a couple guys sleeping every night. They're not going up there either. So it goes back again to not having enough people. We don't have enough people to do foot patrols or even to get in the car and drive around. So, you know, we can we can definitely change when we have the bodies that are available to do it. And like this couple here that are going to the, the police training that we have, the citizen police patrol, are saying that the officers are going to continue to leave if we don't pay them more so we could actually end up being in a worse situation than we are right now. This can't continue. Ladies and gentlemen, perception is reality. And as I want to set up here already, our city has a perception that, that crime here is a major issue. We all agree that, that our city of Myrtle Beach should have the highest paid police officers in the state. If we were to do that, we would be the number one police department in the state. And as far as how do you clean up the area and what vehicle you'd use to change these things, everything is a standard, folks. The way you cut your hair is a standard. The clothes you wear is a standard. The car you drive is a standard. Our city has a standard as well, and they've lowered those standards. They've allowed too many people to sleep on the benches. They've allowed too many homeless people to wander the streets. There's too many vagrants running around who just beg for a living. Our city has gotten to the point where they don't have enough policemen to do 
the minor police work. They stick to the major police work, and they overlook the things that they don't have time to do. It came to my attention the other day. It's been a long time since I've seen a cop in a donut shop. And I had to think about that for a minute, but they don't have time to do that anymore. If you see a cop now, he's by himself in a car, and he has somewhere he has got to go because he's already behind. We need to get back to the point we have a surplus of policemen. And in the plan that I'd like to see put in place, I'd like to have all the cops that we needed. And in the wintertime, if we have cops that we don't need, then we can sub them out to other areas, just as we're borrowing cops in the summer. And I don't want a whole police force full of rookie cops. I'd like to have a police force full of seasoned cops. Just like I think everyone has said up here on the, on, on the panel that perception is key. Our perception right now is, of course, we don't have enough police officers. They're not paid enough money. They need to be paid at least at least fifteen thousand dollars more. Plus, we need really great benefit packages for them. I mean, everyone in this room, I'm sure, has been helped um, hit with the health care. You know, increases and um, you know, benefit packages mean a whole lot also to these officers. In my plan, I would like to see we have put a substation down on 7th Avenue South. I would like to see more substations. We need our officers to have places where they can kind of land. If they need to lock somebody up for a little bit until someone gets there and take them to jail to book them. So be it. We need a place for these guys to land, do paperwork, and then get back out on the streets and do their job. We need to give them the resources that they need to do their job, and they need to be able to enforce the laws. If we enforce the laws, and our reputation would be boosted instantly. And I know that sounds a little confusing, but you know what? If we would enforce the laws, then people will, if the word will get out that they're not going to take it anymore. They have stepped up, and we did not break the laws and get by with it. Thank you. I remember as a, a kid, I used to go down to uh, David Ashley's family's house down there on, on Wither Swash Drive. And the park, when I was young, it was clean. The swash was clean. The police were in and out of there. There was no vagrancy, no dirty needles laying around. You can't go down there now, folks. You've got, you've got people on the, on the park benches shooting up, smoking dope, and doing God knows what else. I want, I want you to ask yourself a question. If you're if you're a family, if you're a police officer, and you go home to your, you go out on the job, you have a beautiful wife or a husband, and you're, you've got two children, and you, you're driving down the road, and you already know that the city is short on manpower, and you see a group of people gathered on the corner, slinging dope, are you going to stop and confront this group of people and possibly get stabbed or shot? Are you going to go by and do your own business and go home to your wife or, or husband and family that night? We don't have enough police officers on the ground. We don't need to add more substations. We, the, the, the Oak Street's empty now. Ladies and gentlemen, you can add all of this fancy stuff you want. We need to hire police officers. That is the end game. I support adding 100 police officers, get down on the south end, take code enforcement, go into these crack motels and make them come up to par with the city ordinance or shut them down. Because at the end of the day, that's what's being attracted to the south end. If you have low, low income, not low income motels that are just giving stuff away, that's what you're going to attract. And I'm not I'm telling you this because I used to drive a taxi in Myrtle Beach and I saw the unedited version of Myrtle oh, Beach yes. at nighttime. Ladies and gentlemen, it comes down to putting boots on the ground, not substations, not fancy police cars. 
police officers, walking the beat, getting into the community, and knowing that your city officials have your back. That's what it's going to take. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a group. Did, did oh, yeah. Oh, okay. First, okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I think the best vehicle uh, our officers can have are the traveling boots. If uh, they were in, if they were a block away from Myrtle Beach Police Department, they could have prevented that, that robbery at the Maryland Fried Chicken. I truly believe that. If they were in Shaker Park, they could have prevented that Senate. I do believe that. That's quality of life policing, that's boots on the ground. You will. When I lived in New York, what they did, if they called somebody, you got a $238 tip. You had a choice, pay that or go to a quality of life class, and you didn't have to pay that tip. But if you didn't do either, you, you had a warrant out for you. Now, do our police currently have enough people or time to implement that type of program? I don't believe we do. Uh, until we get our hiring under control, pay them what they're worth. Attract quality, attract veterans. Or we yeah, have uh, Phil Webster, chief of police, is uh, retired from North Pearl Beach. They seem to have it together. He's local, call him in, have a conference with him, talk to him, see how he, he approached it in North Pearl Beach. Surfside, same thing. How are they approaching? issues that may be similar to ours. I think they've done a better job than us. We're kind of ugly cousin right now. And that's not acceptable. Again, that goes back to how we project ourselves nationwide and in the region. Thanks. Thank you. Um, has everybody spoken on that issue? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Next question is, uh, since y'all are all challenged, <coughs> And uh, there has been a uh, basically a bombardment of uh, mail and that political advertisement saying that y'all want to do away with the uh, homeowner rebate. And uh, I have a two part question. In your opinion, does the TDF work for the city of Myrtle Beach? If it does, say why? And are you in favor of removing the homeowner's rebate part of the TDF tax plan? It's working, right? I think it's working really well for the chamber. They've gotten over about $150 million in 10 years, and they're poised to get that money again. They're paying their top five executives over a million dollars. This is more than the top five people of the city. I mean, really, who is, who is running our city? I, this, is, this issue is what got me involved in running. I knew it was coming up for renewal, and I thought, you know, I really need to look into this, and I had the time to do it. And I came to realize just how much, well, ultimately, that if that money could go to the city instead of to the chamber, that's what we need. Because what I did was I realized that the accommodations taxes are 2% that are collected statewide. And so that would allow us to compare counties and even cities across the state. And I thought, okay, I'm looking into this. I want to find out if it is in fact working. It should show me that the accommodations taxes collected in our county should be much better than everybody else. It should blow everybody else out of the water because we've got had these millions to invest. Well, it turns out that no, not really. Um, our uh, comparing Myrtle Beach alone, just the city, our Ajax collections went up 39%, whereas statewide they went up 51%. So this law was put into effect with no means of measuring results. All that the chamber has to do is to write a list online. See, here's what we spent, this is what it was for, what it was for, and how wonderful, but you no, know, it's not working. What is working is people love the tax credit. I own a home, I love the tax credit. 
Wallace gets five hundred dollars. He said he loves the tax credit. So we have been successfully brought out. I'm one of them. Who's that? Is? I think we should give the money to the city and keep the tax credit. I believe the the tax credit should stay with the residents. I, I don't believe that should be removed. However, there's an issue that comes in with the rest of the money. And just imagine this, if, if, if say we ran a business and we each collected a million dollars and we put that money in the fund and we've got $50 million, well, right away, the first thing someone wants to do is take 30 of that 50 million and send it somewhere else to another group of people. Would that be fair? That's what we're doing. Our money, when it goes to Columbia, does not come back. The only thing that stays here is, is the 20% is the that goes to pay the taxes for the, for the citizens that live here, and there's a little bit more, probably 10% comes back for infrastructure. The rest of that money's gone. We don't know if it's gone. You don't know where it is. They've been asking for, for audits. That money's gone. You don't get it back. What we need to do is, is focus on what we can do. And what we have to do right now is live with this thing to the best of our ability. The TDF, whether you like it or not, it's one of two things. It was either written so cleverly that it couldn't be dissolved, or it was written so poorly that it didn't have an end date or a time to it or, or in, to expire. So what we have to do is work with this thing to the best of our ability and stop these monies that leave our city and don't come back. That's the problem we have today. Every penny collected within the city should stay within the city. And that's not what we have today. Thank you. I really think that the TDF has benefited our area. A lot of these people that have relocated here, um, especially from the northern states, they pay at least $10,000, up to $20,000 a year on their property taxes. And they've come down here and hardly pay a small percentage. You know, people, people relocate here because we are a great place to live. The TDF has worked for us. The money that is generated that goes back into um, advertising for the tourists, if we don't have tourists here, our property taxes will go up. The money has got to come somewhere. And it is necessary for us to keep it in place. However, I would not be um, opposed to, at some point in time, putting on a referendum if our community is educated on it. There's so many things floating, information that's floating around out there, bashing on it, this and that and the other, everybody just needs to be educated on it, and then we can put it to a referendum and make it be fair. Thank you. I think people are pretty educated on the TDF. <laughs> um, the city gets, the chamber gets a pile of money, okay? 20% of that goes to property tax reduction, okay? And in that 20%, you're only getting about 82% of that, of that 20% for the property tax reduction. I say take the 20%, give the property owners a full 20%, which means 100% of the 20%. This way, the chamber's not getting the rest of the city. Give it back to the property tax owners, and then you take the rest of the money that goes to the chamber of commerce you split that up, which comes to about 11.5 million, give that to the city, and let them hire police officers. So it's a win-win for everybody. The chamber keeps part of their money for that ad tax, for the advertising of the city. The residents get the full 20, full 100% of the 20% instead of 82, and actually with the growth, it's going down. So next year, you'll probably see a, your tax reduction actually go, go a little, you, you'll be paying a little bit more on your property tax because of the revenue that's going down. So I say give the full 20%. The chamber keeps half of the pile of 11.5. The city gets 11.5. It's a win-win for everybody. We can add 100 new police officers. Our community becomes safe and everybody wins. 
It's a pretty simple thing to me. That's what I would do. Thank you. It's not that easy. We're having to deal with legislatures in Columbia. These folks in Columbia, you know, they really don't care if they get, we get money back or not. If we, if we go to Columbia and tell them well, we want all this money back, we stand to lose every bit of this, everything that we've gained so far. So I don't agree with that. Can we go on to the next? Can I, I need to rebut that. Yeah. Well, I'll let you rebut it. Please go ahead. Real quick. Yeah, exactly. Okay. TDR, TDR rolled out in 2009 after the 08 financial floods. That was their intention to advertise their way back into business that they lost. Um, that's a bad idea, but again, 20% of that was supposed to go back to infrastructure. That's how they built the boardwalk. That's how it was funded. Now, it doesn't have to be all hard scale. We can have that money go to our police force. Fund it, get them what they need, get them into the community as quickly and as effectively as possible. This should have been put in place without a referendum in the first place. The voters have the right to vote on a tax like this. Second off, Jackie is right to the extent you're not just going to walk into Columbia and get your money back. You're not going to do that. It's going to take time. You're probably going to have to work with the governor. You're probably going to have to work with your legislatures. You're going to have to. Because you know what they want here? I would say straight up. They're going to be trying to make you a deal to bring casinos here. Or are they just going to say, no, just keep it like this? Because the legislatures want casinos. Because you know who pays for everything in the state? Merle Beach. We're the revenue source for the state. When you need a road paved in God knows what, Kershaw County, Myrtle Beach is paying for that. Ain't nobody else. Myrtle Beach. And to keys, I'm on both of your sides here now. We do need our money back. We need more than just police officers. As I say, we need police. We need infrastructure improvements. We need tons of more things to come back into the city. But the only reason that these incumbents are sending this mail stuff out that's saying you're going to get rid of this is because they know that they have no chance at winning this election again. That's all. <laughs> and the only reason I'm saying that is because they've gone on and on and on with all this stuff for all this time now. But that's the only reason they're doing it. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Marine fundamentally don't understand government legislation. It's the people, the taxpayers' money that goes to Columbia. Okay? Uh, somebody who's been involved in, in the process and the legislators for a long time, having been in Columbia, understand the fundamental workings of it. She fundamentally is misinformed. The fact of the matter is, if you go to Columbia, you meet with the governor, you meet with our state delegation. They will, they will take that money. The state is already spending money to send police officers to Myrtle Beach. It, 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 it's a very small change in the law. The governor will do it. He'll be happy to do that, to rid the burden on other communities who are sending their police departments down here. So it, it's just a fact, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Rebuttal. Yeah, right now. We're going to go. 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 We're going local legislators that will work for us instead of for the chamber.
uh, making contact with the Sun News. And it refers to the South Carolina Supreme Court as considering making local chamber of commerce, including murder missionary chamber, subject to the Freedom of Information Act as it, as it gives a lawsuit against the Hilton Head bluffing chamber of commerce. Uh, I'd like your comments how you feel about this Supreme Court case and if it rules in favor of the Freedom of Information Act, what will you do your next step if you're elected? Well, the, the, to make one thing very clear, the chamber, all the monies that we're talking about are taxpayer money, which are directed to the, to the chamber. And by all means, if it's taxpayer money, who should not know where their money's being spent? That, that's the biggest money. And as far as, as far as what to do about it, I believe the Supreme Court's going to decide for us. And by all means, that money should be accounted for every penny. Thank you so much. I would have to agree because if they're dealing with taxpayers' money, everything should be transparent. Whether it is with the chamber or whether it's with our city government, state government, or federal government, everything should be transparent. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. I I support that 100 percent taxpayer money should be accounted for. I, I would also call on a forensic audit for the Chamber of Commerce, even if if, if this doesn't pass. Because after at the end of the day, it's your money. You should know where your money is going. The Chamber should not be doing the bidding of legislation in Columbia. They are a private entity that is to promote business, not go and do bidding for the city taxpayers and let the taxpayer know what they're going to do for the, for the citizens. That's not how that works. And somehow in Myrtle Beach, that's got twisted. So let's get back in, uh, let's get back to the basics of what government should and shouldn't be doing. Your, your state delegation, your local uh, council should be working for you. So I fully support a forensic audit on the chamber. And I hope that the Supreme Court does make that uh, um, come to fruition. Thank you. Yeah, I pretty much agree. Uh, the chamber needs to be audited, independent, outside audit, not their friends, not the same people that have been running their audit for years. They need, it needs to be somebody they don't know so we know that we can trust them. And this goes back to transparency in the government. It's not private money, it's public money that's been gathered and we need to know where it's going. Thank you. I agree 100 percent Every last penny of the taxpayer's pay needs to be audited and needs to be made sure. I think we all agree that on the stage. But on a quick note, if it's Randall Wallace or Loud or whoever in the world is sending out the phone calls right now, would you please stop calling me because I'm in a debate. Thank you. <laughs> I certainly agree that it should be audited. I looked at every single expenditure from 2009 all the way through 2016. I called an attorney. I asked about a class action lawsuit regarding these taxes. I was told that because this particular attorney won a lawsuit against the city about appraisals, the state legislature in this state got together and made a law that you cannot file a class action lawsuit in our state if it involves taxes. This is, this is unreal. Tax money should not be spent for advertising. The whole concept is convoluted. When you look at how it started, it was started to pay for advertising for businesses. But hello, if you live in Greenville and you're in an area that they produce BMWs, should taxpayers be advertising cars? Not really. Now, if our state wants to do some institutional advertising, let the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism use money to bid out. And they can bid out to different companies and get this done 
instead of the chamber getting the money and bidding out to who knows where. And then even if they're audited, we don't know what money's going to come back to the chamber. So, you know, as far as the individual expenditures, though, like I said, I looked at every single item that was spent. And personally, I don't see how putting a banner at a ball field in Atlanta that says Myrtle Beach on it is going to bring us more money. And then one last thing is that apparently since it's not helped us grow our business compared to other areas that don't have it, what has happened? Well, a lot of us think that the companies like the hotels and such don't have to spend their money advertising because the taxpayers are doing it. And that's not right. All right, let's continue on. Uh, this is a two-part question because it's got, I've got two parts of it. It has to do with uh, economic development. Uh, number one, do you, you support eminent domain, the taking of private property by government in the redevelopment of downtown Myrtle Beach? If you do, state the reason yes. If you don't, uh, no, state the reason no, why. And also, the second part of that, uh, how do you rate the job done by the Downtown Redevelopment Corporation over the past 10 years? And for the reason for the answer. Oh, this is easy. Absolutely not. We don't want any, any eminent domain. If we do eminent domain, it should be for a road. successful business, if it's a big business or a small business, if that's the business people have poured their heart and soul in, and that's their life earned savings, they deserve the right to see it through whatever comes. And as far as is, um, the second part of that question. Uh, I, the second part was how do you rate the job done by the downtown? The DRC. The the corporation of the past few years, they the recent appearance. The, the, the DRC should be dissolved yesterday. I was in the room 25 years ago when downtown redevelopment started. We met at the top of the Flatiron Building. For those of you that don't know where that is, that's the building that used to sit where Nance Plaza is today. John Singleton led the meeting, and it was the first time before Broadway and the beach was built, and we could see the city growing, and we needed to do something. The DRC was formed out of a knee-jerk reaction to help that downtown area re redevelop and revitalize, and somehow that morphed its way right into parking meters and parking restrictions until now. It's turned a stranglehold on the whole city and given a bad attitude and flavor to our tourists and locals alike. The DRC has to go. And as far as their purpose, the purpose in the beginning was revitalization. And revitalization can be accomplished many different ways. We don't need a private entity telling us how to run our city. Thank you. I do not believe in eminent domain myself either. Um, it is only needs to be used during um, a necessity for our citizens, for example, a road or a, we don't have dams here, but for a dam, something that's deemed necessary for our citizens. So other than that, I don't believe in eminent domain. Um, kind of like what Mike said, I think the DRC a long time ago was put together for the right reason. However, I think it's gotten off track. I think um, we shouldn't, DRC shouldn't be in the business of redevelopment as much as it should be as helping small businesses and people come in, uh, grow in the downtown area. That is just that simple. Thank you. The answer is no to eminent domain. That's big government theft. It, it, that, plain and simple. It's in Steve. Plain and simple. That's government bullying their way, telling people what they do. My granddaddy told me when I was a young boy, son, government may be your uncle, but it ain't your daddy. So it's time that the citizens wake up and, and, and take their government back and hold them accountable. They work for the people. 
And somehow we lost that way with our elected officials. Um, the downtown redevelopment, total disaster. Total disaster. If you see what's happening downtown, it's, it's infested with crime. You go down on the sidewalks, there's bubble gum all over the sidewalks. Ladies and gentlemen, we didn't have that when I grew up. The streets were safe. The community was clean. The people were friendly. And we had a thriving downtown. It's not so thriving anymore. But we can, we can fix it together. We can fix it together. Thank you. Yeah. You said I'm a name. That was a um, kind of a cowardly approach to deal with uh, your citizens and your neighbors and, and friends, people who've known, known for a good long time. And the city is so desperate to further what they believe is a good agenda, and it's not. You don't need the Children's Museum and Library downtown. You need better ideas. So you said your name was just an ugly act. And uh, we need to vote people out if we allow that to happen. And um, as far as DRC, uh, it, it started with good intentions, I'm sure, but I don't see any evidence of them. They're just stop popping money for themselves. But again, where is it going and what's it going to be used for? So, again, it needs to be dissolved, reformulated, and maybe take another shot at it down the road. But as it stands now, if it's not working, then it needs to go. I see no tenant domain unless it's for a road or a power pole. Those are only two things that I think even domain is useful. Secondly, no to the library. We don't have money for this whole thing right now. So there we bought the buildings. I don't even know what they were doing with all this. But as far as the DRC goes, if the DRC was really passionate about downtown redevelopment, the David Seabock would be out there cutting the oak trees and the palmetto trees and all that stuff and trimming it up and making it look good. And he'd also be pressure washing the sidewalk instead of riding around his Jaguar. That's all. No, the eminent domain, you know, I just posted an article that said the same that wrote said, you know, that's not set in stone. You know, the library, the museum thing, that, that's just an idea. We, you know, we don't have, we don't even have the funding for that. We haven't voted on that. Well, of course, you all know why that came up. They came up with that because they were outed as far as having plans to buy, they were in fact buying property behind our backs secretly because, as you know, we have no transparency here. A lot of secrecy, so absolutely no to that. And as far as the DRC, it's kind of hard to talk about the DRC without talking about parking, because parking is a lot of the funding that they get. Um, I personally don't think that the DRC should have been ever set up as a separate entity, as a nonprofit. If we were going to do things as a city, the city ought to do it. We don't need all these different pots of money with people that are quasi involved in the city making these side deals. There's a fellow that bought a hotel here and he was working outside in the front. And his car drove up, and the guy rolled down the window, and he said, you owe us for hybrid parking. And the fellow said, what? Who are you? Well, it turned out to be David Seabock. And he, he explained that because there was a little strip of land that the city owned where the, the people parked, that he was going to have to pay him for parking. But he didn't know anything about it. It never came up at closing. You know, so he asked, well, what, what if I don't pay? I don't know anything about this. He said, well, then we'll put our parking meters. And you know, if you go down the, the area downtown, my office is at 16th Avenue. If you go toward the ocean, you'll see lots where obviously there used to be a mom and pop hotel, but they came in and they put meters up and so the hotel had closed. So as far as the parking goes, I think we should have great parking. Right. And that half of the money that is income from parking is used up by the expenses of taking care of the parking. 
So let's have free parking, bring people back, have restrooms, changing rooms, and then we'll have families that are coming back to the city. You hear citizens speak about transparency in government. It's spoken from Washington to the little towns like Morris, Surfside Beach. If you're elected, what will you do to ensure more transparency in Myrtle Beach City government? That's a loaded question. <laughs> well, I um, I'm all about transparency. Um, as a lot of y'all know, uh, I actually have been sat on city boards for several years now. And um, I always believe that there should be more transparency. I don't believe that our boards and committees interact enough. I don't believe each board should have their minutes um, given to other boards so we know what's going on in the minutes and everything else. I don't believe that we should be having a city council workshop on one morning and then voting that afternoon. I don't think it gives the citizens enough time to digest what is actually going on. I think it should be changed to different days. That would be one reason, one way of changing it. Again, like I said, every committee that, that is part of the city needs to be transparent and out there, let the citizens know what's going on. Thank you. Transparency keeps your elected officials honest. And that's the bottom line. How many people are happy with their legislators today or their representation? They've got probably the worst rating ever. So what I propose is something that I've been fighting for for many years now. City Council has their council meetings at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Most people are working then. People work for a living. They don't get off until at least 5. And every other single municipality that I know, their meetings start between 5.30 and 6. Everywhere. You should know what's going on in your city. And the people who work for you should have the common respect to give that to you and let you know what's going on. So if I'm elected, I will push for a 6 o'clock meeting. I will have monthly meetings, coffee with your councilman, so you know how Go break up the city into four different areas and meet with the people of our city. But most importantly, transparency will completely follow, I believe, when you break the city up into districts. We need to have districts, individual districts that people can vote. This way, everybody that's living on the north end is not on council and the south end it's the boot. We've been facing that for years now. And it's time that the South End has equal representation. Transparency. Let's open it up. My number is 843-467-3175. Call me night or day. I'm here, even if I'm not elected, I'll be here to fight for you as I've been since 2008 when I set out on this campaign. Thank you. Well, if I'm elected and after I wake up from the shop, <laughs> I will, <laughs> I will uh, definitely uh, want to change council meeting times. I think it's a good idea to have a little bit of breathing room for the work between the workshop and the boat. And um, change so that the citizens, that's who we work for, who will work for, and citizens can partake. 
And maybe harder, first, before we make a decision, not afterwards. I know they're filmed, they're, they can be seen on our local access, but also we haven't seen minutes in a quite a long time. So being vocal, being seen, being heard, that's important to you. And that's what we have to do to make sure you trust us before you put any of us in office. I think uh, transparency is a big deal. Council meetings should be at 6 o'clock. Workshops should be on Thursday at 6 o'clock. The Thursday before the council meeting on the Tuesday. Plenty of time in between to think about stuff and know how things are going to go out. Also, there's no debate that takes place. Everything, when they come out there to vote, they already know how they're going to vote. I mean, nothing even takes place in city council chambers anymore except for yes or no. That's the only two things that happen. Or they'll get out on the board, which that's fine too. But anyways, on top of that, meetings at six o'clock and need to be live streamed on the local channel, and our, our minutes need to be updated on the website. I haven't been updated since 2015, so whatever was happening in 2015, I guess, is more relevant than what's happening right now, which is I don't understand that. Also, single member districts do need to be put in place for single member districts, and like he said, there should be something monthly. Or they should be town halls, and you should be able to talk to that person every month, and they should be able to go back to council chambers with your input in mind. Thank you. I agree with that, with what's been said, and I would add to that that what I'd like to do is have established a relationship with a lot of people on Facebook. I'd like to continue after I'm elected, and so I would be your watchdog then, and I would let you know what's going on. I look at the numbers, I read the ordinances. I don't care if they're 30 pages. We need someone who can read and understand. And which reminds me, I forgot to say, I keep forgetting to say, it. I have, I'm the only candidate that's running with a master's degree in management. And I own my own business and have for 30 years. But as far as transparency goes, you know, having meetings later, um, having single member districts, but also, I don't know if I have a chance to mention it, so I'll mention it now, term limits, that I uh, vow to serve no more than two terms. Transparency kind of comes back to integrity. And one, one lesson I learned from one of the people that come through your life you never forget is, she said, everybody's got a tab. You're either adding to it or taking away from it. She was a waitress. She said, everybody's got a tab. You're either nice to people, you do the right thing, or you're not nice to people and you don't do the right thing. But one day it's going to catch up to you. And right now the crowd we got, I believe it's caught up to them. You can't do these backroom deals, folks. You just can't do them. The back door to City Hall has got to be closed. If I started running for office, you start going around and talking to people that go, oh man, I'd love to vote for you, but I can go to this person right now and I can get anything I want in the city. And I go, that's okay, thanks, because you don't need to vote for me because I'm not doing that. And I went to someone else's house and we were talking. They said, what are you going to do when people come up to you and they want you to help them do something? I go, well, I'm going to carry them right to the front door of City Hall and show them where they need to go. They go, no, no, you've got to help them. I'm like, no, that's not what I'm running for office for. I don't want that kind of burden on my shoulder. I'm not going to do it. And transparency comes back from two things. It is back to member districts, and it's back to term limits. If you can't get done what you need to do in eight years, you need to move out of the way and let someone else do it. Absolute power is corrupting, and absolute power is absolutely corrupting. And there's just too much going on under the scenes. This is too much money. And you can't operate that way because it's going to happen whether you want it to or not. The only way you can protect it is to be as transparent as possible. Get those term limits in there. Get those member districts so people are held accountable for what they've done. Don't give them enough road to hang themselves. That's a mistake. And as far as that back door to City Hall, I just don't believe in that. I never have. I think people need to be forthright and up front because it's in everybody's best interest to make the best decision for our city. Thank you so much. We're going to get to economic development, and uh, this is kind of a generalized question, but uh, I'm sure some of y'all have business in 
uh, experience. What would you do to make, bring in better and high, higher paying jobs and careers to the Myrtle Beach area? Well, I'll tell you, I um, kind of was pretty impressed with the presentation that from the gentleman that came up from Charleston about bringing tech jobs to the city. Doesn't take infrastructure, doesn't take deep ports, doesn't take rail, doesn't take any of that. What it takes is a building, some cubicles, and some high speed internet. And Charleston grew their, their tech industry there. They got over 22,000 new jobs in downtown Charleston. The average salary is about $80,000. Wow. Can you imagine what that would do to our city? It would be huge. So if we can do that, promote that, get the downtown redevelopment cleaned up, clean that down, clean up the blighted areas, I think foot traffic will flow, people will start coming in. You put that smile back on the on our city and say businesses are welcome. Do you know the city of Myrtle Beach has the highest business license fee in the state of South Carolina? Why would anybody come and do business in the city if they're, they're being taxed? You know, at the end of the day, that two to four thousand dollars could make you or break you. It's about the bottom line. Our city's hurting right now. We need good jobs. And we're only one natural disaster from ending our economy here. Because we are a tourist-based driven industry. We have to diversify. We have to go after new jobs and get people in here. And I think if you put a, a practical team together, we can do it. It's been done. It's done in Charleston. It's done in many other places, in fact. The people that, are, that started in Charleston, they have now based down in Buford. They've got a sister community down there that they're, they're expanding. What do you think? So I think if you think outside the box and start promoting that, it would be huge for our city. Thank you. Well, there's people much smarter than me that'll figure out how to bring in bigger industry. Uh, the Economic uh, Development Corp is one of them. I know just read today about a company called Greenlawn, I believe, that is bringing 317 jobs. So people who can do that, that's who needs to uh, do that. I'll support that in any way I can. But what I'd like to see is more incubator business. Uh, we have spaces that are open and all through the downtown area. We can uh, work with, we got the Culinary Institute right out back here. I, I'd like to see an incubator kitchen developed somewhere in the uh, city, preferably downtown, so that people can come in, start their own catering businesses. It's a rental space, you rent four hour blocks. If you have a food truck, I'm hoping we'll get a food truck um, service going here shortly. Uh, they can prep what they need for the food trucks and it cycles, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. People can start a small business, they can meet up with other like-minded individuals, just out of this one incubator hub, and they can come together and perhaps pull the resources to start their own restaurant. Something, something more interesting than what we have. So we can do that. You can have rental gallery spaces, reach out to the uh, Coastal Carolina University or Arts Department. Those kids can produce work and sell it online, but not to everybody. If you can uh, develop a rental space, a tough gallery, that they can showcase their works, that will give them another boost. That's, again, is trying to promote small business. So that, that's what I'd like to see, more incubative small business. And uh, watching that grow, I think it'd be really interesting. So on Monday, me and Michael Bika and a downtown restaurant, we were standing out in the dance class. And I 
window of the restaurant owner. I said, would you mind if two food trucks parked right here in this plaza? He said, no, I wouldn't care at all. I think it would actually help, help downtown. You're right on the whole food truck thing. This whole thing's a disaster. If you want to have a food truck here, man, bring your food truck here and make sure you your money and have your money. And on top of that, let me go in another direction. A lot of people don't want to talk about this, and I understand why, but I'll give what I'm tired of. We're bringing these students from across the ocean over there, over here into our city, to work during the summer. They live in these slave quarter type things. They get paid nothing. Many of them won't even make it back home due to sex trafficking and other things right there. But let me tell you something else. I, I'm not really, I don't really like that. Because you go into our streets in our community, you got youth that are being sucked up into the street. They're getting on this drug stuff, they're selling drugs, they're getting into these gangs and stuff. How about we stop the whole worrying about, or bringing other people in and let's worry about our community. Let's get our kids into these jobs. Let's get our kids. And I, I, just, I, just, I just want to be as nice as I can. This is nothing against it, but I'd rather see somebody in my community as a lifeguard on the ocean than somebody else that I can't talk to. I'm just saying. So if I'm drowning, I want to be able to hear you know, somebody I know from this community come and save me. I'm just saying. But that's what I'd like to get back to. And I, I understand these businesses are trying to save money. That's understandable. But you got to understand that these kids and these youth are the future of this city. So we got to get them into the workplace as well. I too, like Mark from Bride's plan for the IT incubator program, it would cost maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars to get started, and there is that expert in Charleston that can help us, just like he's helping the center in Hubert. So I think it's worth a try. I can't guarantee 100% that it would work, but wow, if it does. I mean, if it does, this is a game changer. We're talking about hundreds or thousands of jobs at $80,000 each. That would be awesome. And I also like Ed Carey, what he says regarding getting out of the way. You know, let's get out of the way of businesses locating here. Let's be wel welcoming. I like the story that Mike told about Ocean Isle. There's a business that opened there, and the city sent over a bouquet of flowers. Myrtle Beach, we send over code enforcement. You know, <laughs> let's let's be nice and welcoming, and um, you know, and, and really go out there and communicate with other entities like the Regional Economic Development Authority. We need to share information. I one of the things I do in my business is I compose resumes for individuals. So I thought I would do this extra step with this fellow that had experience in manufacturing. I thought, I'll provide him some free information about the various manufacturers that we have in the city, because we have manufacturers in the city. We have them in the county. So I called. I called the Chamber of Commerce. I called the city. I called the Regional Economic Development. Can I get a list of manufacturers and what they make? We, we don't have it, nobody had it. The same thing I ran into back in the 90s when I invented what I call the earring thing. And I wanted to have it manufactured in South Carolina. I called the Department of Commerce and I tried to find out who in South Carolina could manufacture this earring thing. Nobody could help me. I mean, hello, don't we know what businesses are here? You know, can't we get that information together so that when businesses want to locate here, we can say to them, here's what's available. You know, you might be able to use not only manufacturers, but other service businesses as well. I want to tell you, we want to talk about brand business. This town, this is my forte. This is real simple, folks. It's not hard at all. The same things that defeated the food trucks is what's defeated the business in the town right now. There's two things you don't want to ever see show up at your property, and that's David Seabock and Ollie Murphy, <laughs> Ollie Smith. If either of them show up, you're going to get hit with fines, penalties, and restrictions. You can't function that way. When you turn around and you look at that ocean front over there, you start looking down the street, we don't have millions, hundreds of millions. We have billions of dollars worth of real estate standing there. These are the nicest motels on the South Carolina coast. There is no excuse 
that we don't have money flowing in and out of this city at an exponential rate. We've become so accustomed to relying on that chamber of commerce or people telling us what can and can't be done, we forgot how to do it for ourselves. Number one, all you have to do is start with something simple. If we could streamline some things with the CAB to where people could come right down Highway 17 and start repainting their buildings and redoing their signs without having to go through a one month or two month approval, you'd see everybody start fixing up their buildings. The second thing is, if we remove some of these impact fees from restaurants where you have to pay two to three hundred dollars a seat to open a restaurant, we could start opening up little venues all throughout the city instantaneously. If the city would go down here on these sidewalks and put sidewalks between Highway 17 and the ocean front, create avenues for all those tens of thousands of tourists to start walking up the streets where they did feel safe again, and it comes back to public safety, we've got this perception we've got to fix. We have to make a psychological turn. Once that turn is made, the floodgates are going to open right up. Then we'll have to manage the business that's coming. This isn't hard. You can look at the food trucks and find the same reasons why they're not coming, and those same reasons will apply to everything else. We have to get the city, the economic engine cranked back up. I always tell people, you know, we've got, we've got an eight-cylinder engine running on four cylinders. And that truly is the problem. Yeah. And if you go down on Highway 17 on the north of the south end about 4 o'clock in the afternoon in the summers, so all you're going to see is lines of traffic leaving the city. There's nowhere to eat inside of Myrtle Beach anymore. All those tens of thousands of tourists that are here every day are going wow. somewhere else to spend their money. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. As I said before, I'm in the hospitality business. However, I think we need to diversify our jobs. Um, for the longest time, hospitality has driven this area, but we also need to bring back and keep our young people that live here and grow up here. And that means creating good paying jobs. Um, I'd like to go back to what Matthew said about the students that come over, overseas to come work here. And there's a reason for that. Unfortunately, again, in the hospitality business, no one wants to work anymore. People have been um, rewarded for staying at home instead of getting out and getting a job. And until that changes, we have to kind of rely on the student, foreign students. They come over here, um, and, and that's why you see a lot of them here. But back to the main topic, our jobs need to stay here. We need to keep our young people here. We don't have an interstate yet. We have a rail system that is going through, I think, refurbishment. So we don't have that. We have to rely on either light manufacturing, um, tech jobs, anything that does not require a large plot of land. And we need to try to bring businesses in here that will tap into that. That's the only way that we're going to be able to grow our jobs outside of the hospitality sector. Thank you. Look, I respect what she said. I really do. But I grew up here and I worked in these little 10 and 7 dollar hour jobs. I had to. I had no choice. Okay, let me tell you. I guess that I respect what you do, but it's all about money. It's what it's all about. When you save money, then you might as well bring them in. And secondly, like you said, you want to keep your kids here, you want to bring them back. Why are you going to keep them here if they get stuck on the streets dealing drugs or addicted to drugs or shooting people? Well, that's all I have to say on this. So thank you. I like Brooks' turn. I keep track of it. Have you stuck on it? Yes. I thought it was. He did. Right. Right. I'm right. um, right. going to go on to the next question. This, it still has about the economic value. Uh, just recently, it was probably a couple of months ago, I attended a meeting right here in this very hall uh, with the Myrtle Beach Regional Economic Development Corporation. 
And they told us about jobs that were available to advance manufacturing, which already Georgetown Tech, this building, the place we're sitting in, had that now. For example, $41,000 was the average starting pay for a person graduating in advanced manufacturing. In aviation, which we're sitting right here on the airport, it was $71,000. What will you do? It elected to look into that providing jobs in what I'm talking about, aviation and advanced manufacturing for the city of Mobile Again, I'm mean, going to have to say that there are people that are smarter than me and that they can bring that type of manufacturing. I, I can't go out and find a building. But we can put together a, a workshop to try to figure out how to do that. Owens in Charleston, we could bring in, I'm sure they need something that we call whatever small part group that would go to that. But uh, again, as far as the what was the second part of the pay scale? Okay. It was forty one thousand for the average person graduated advanced manufacturing. Seventy one thousand for aviation. Sounds good so far. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna be ignorant. I'm not gonna stand up here trying to talk about something I don't know. And I I owe that to y'all. I don't know, I'm not gonna to pretend to know. So I'll pass it off to uh, As far as bringing a larger industry to Myrtle Beach, it's really hard because of all the taxes and fees that we're gonna put on these people. And we should be offering more incentives. The PTI Institute is a place where we should be sending our kids. They should be going there and they should be learning how to be engineers on airplanes and everything. We have the ability to do these things. I just say, let's get started on it. Let's stop going through all this Government bureaucracy stuff, let's just unleash the beast. I need to find out more about this issue as well. I, you know, I know that we have the, the park here that is for aviation, but as far as I know, it seems to be like one of those other parks that we tend to develop in the county where they build this park and it sits there and nothing ever occurs. I think they're finally, they've got something out here, the VA Center. Administrative Center, that's going to go there. We need to try to work with the Regional Economic Development Center uh, as a city working with the county and that to, to go out to trade shows around the country, talk to companies. I really don't think we need to go to China to try to get people to invest here. You know, the mayor's job is supposed to be administrative only. I mean, it's not supposed to be administrative. It's supposed to be more of a figurehead type thing, and I don't see how it could possibly be legal for the, the mayor to be going to China to get business to come here for, to buy private industry. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so let's let's work with other entities. It's not an easy situation, but I think we can do it if we all work together. I said before, one thing I think the city kind of got lost on is sports tourism. We've relied on the Chamber of Commerce and, and in the 09 and 010 when we started looking at other avenues to bring, bring people to the city. We went into sports tourism and we went full board. And it's done a great job. But there are things that have fallen through the cracks. We're one of the few people, you know this area, this is one of the largest runways in the state. You can land anything they have on this runway. That's something other cities don't offer. We have, the, we have the ability for all this acreage out here that was set aside for the industry. It's never been dealt with. No one's probably ever tried to go out and court these businesses here. And when you court them here, one thing I learned with Broadway at the beach, in the inception, all they talked about was critical mass, critical mass. You have to have enough there so that the thing will take on a life of itself and it will function. If we have to go offer up some incentives, but we have to give free space for a few years, just like how Hard Rock, Hard Rock uh, 
the hard rock building that used to sit out there at Broadway at the beach, they had free rent for 10 or 15 years. That was the draw that brought the rest of the people. If we have to create incentives, they'll have to be done. Diversification is the only way to have a year-round economy and to have year-round employment. Thank you. I would have to agree with Michael on uh, bringing incentive plans for these businesses to come here. Um, actually, uh, I happen to know the woman that uh, is Department of Commerce in Columbia, and they've already been actively at, uh, working with companies uh, to come into South Carolina. There's no reason why we couldn't, with her help, also bring companies to Myrtle Beach area. She also works with the school systems because when these companies come in, they need skilled labor. So she will go to the schools itself, tap into what their labor needs are, and they can go ahead and start training these people. So I think it's a collaborative thing as a city. We need to work with our State Department of Commerce and our schools to, to help it uh, cultivate and to put good paying jobs here, small businesses. Yeah, I uh, tend to agree 100%. Uh, we have to diversify our economy here. But one thing I really like to talk about is how society has really stigma, put a stigma on people who go into the trade industry, such as mechanics and plumbers and electricians. These are good paying jobs. And somehow we lost our way by saying, if you don't go to a four-year college and get a, a degree, a liberal arts degree, a Greek philosophy, something's, you know, something's wrong. And that's what's happened, not just here, but throughout the country. We have stigmatized a two-year training degree. Those are good-paying jobs, electricians, and plumbers, and master carpenters. So somehow we lost our way. If we can get back to that, these are the people that build our cities, our communities, people that we trust. But again, you know, I'm, I'm going to agree with Brooks here. That uh, the question on, on on that is that's beyond my pay grade. I don't know anything about that, but I'd be willing to uh, research it and, and uh, do what's best for our community. Thank you. Okay, we're, we're about to go over, but I'm going to do one one more question. This is going to be my last question. Um, we have a lot of retired, retired people down here, and those retired people are looking at you up here wanting to be elected, and they want to know, are you going to protect their quality of life? Are you going to keep our streets safe? And... What I need you to do is speak directly to the retired people out here, the people that are retired on social, fixed income, social security, or retirement program, and tell them what you're going to do to make sure their quality of life and streets of Myrtle Beach are safe for them to drive from. Well, for those that are retired, that have moved here, that are in their life in this community, for one, I do feel bad for all the negative things. Good things we've got to be, we've got all these good entities, and I hope that you use them. What I'm going to do is we're going to put police officers on the streets. We're going to begin working on our alcohol systems in the ocean to keep our ocean clean. And we're going to keep on adding these things. We're going to offer incentives to businesses to bring them here. But I'm going to go back to the other thing also, we're going to make sure that your children and your grandchildren also have good jobs if they're here with you. This is the perfect place to live as long as we begin to work and to move forward and get rid of the past. Get rid of these incumbents, move forward, bring in new vision, new ideas, and that's the best way forward, and that's what we have to do. Thank you. I'd like to say to the residents of Market Common, people that are retired here and are happy and everything's wonderful and it's a beautiful place, watch out though, there might be a parking meter coming to the street for you. You don't look right. So it goes back to my mind uh, to money because it takes money 
to have a safe city. It takes money to clean the beach. We've got to get the outlaws built. The problem is, going back again, is that this, this leadership at the city council level and also at the management level have failed because they're doing the wrong things. Managers do things right, leaders do the right things, and our leaders are not doing the right because they're too busy trying to put heads on beds. They're talking about building more ball fields. We're talking about borrowing $25 million more, and our taxes are just going to keep going up and up and up. And the people, okay, we get a tax break if we have a residence, but if you own a business here, if you have a second home, you know, you're paying those full taxes. Not only that, they're not 4%, they're 6%. So we need to get a handle on what we're doing with the money. I think one of the things that we should do is to have someone in the city responsible for crossing department lines. If you've ever worked in a corporation, each department operates separately like it does in the city, and everyone's very protective about their budget. And they'll also tell you, if given a chance, that probably their department is the most important department of all the other departments. But anyway, what we need is maybe someone at the assistant manager level that would be able to go into everybody's books and start with zero-based budgeting every year. Look for contracts that are not being utilized fully. Uh, look at personnel. I think another thing we need to do is to be ensure that we have the right people who are employed. Well, if, yeah. there, if there's an opening, we need to put that opening out into the public and not hire somebody's boyfriend or somebody that happens to be a friend of the mayor's wife. We need to get the very best people to work for us Save as much money as we can, keep our costs low, clean the beach, and have a great place for retired people to live the rest of their time. Well, for the seniors and those people that choose to come here for retirement, there's two things they really want that I understand. One of them is, is they're really happy with the tax break they get on their residence, and I'd like to see that stay. They, everybody deserves something for living here and having to put up with the tourists that we do. The other thing that they deserve is they deserve to be live in peace, and they deserve good, honest police protection. One thing that bothers me more than anything else is when people come here, just like senior citizens, it's not long before their children and their grandchildren are visiting, and then they need to take them somewhere to entertain them. And I don't want to hear anybody being ashamed of the boardwalk or being ashamed of the downtown. That's got to stop. We need to make our city a place where everyone can be welcome and you can feel safe to take your children and grandchildren and go back and get ice cream where you did 20 years ago. Or go get pizza or go out to eat or ride around and look at things that are nice and attractive without having to see undesirable elements in your face. Reality. And if everything looked like Disney World, we'd all be happy. And when you come to Disney World, there's an expectation when you get there that this is a nice place, it's safe, and it's a family environment. And I'd like to see that expectation come back to our city. It wouldn't be hard. It'd just take a little initiative. We'd have to upgrade the police department. We'd have to increase some amenities. And we have to remember that this is a vacation capital of the world, and it's something we all should be proud of. And we want to make sure every visitor here is proud when they leave to say, I came to Myrtle Beach. Thank you. For the retirees that have moved here, I appreciate you living here. I appreciate you relocating here. This is the most wonderful place that you could ever live. Um, I've lived here all my life, so I, I would tend to think that. I will promise you that we will improve on our public safety. We will drive the crime out of our streets. We are going to keep our water quality. We are going to keep an eye on it to make sure that it does not harm anyone. We're going to make sure that you have a great quality of life living here. We're going to keep the infrastructure up to date and current. My stepdad was a retired Navy military. 
He lived on fixed income, just as my mom at times lives on fixed income. So we have to keep things livable. People have to enjoy their quality of life and not be price gouged. We need to keep everything um, obtainable. So we appreciate you moving here. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I get a little emotional uh, because I grew up here. And I'm seeing my childhood memories ripped away. Many of you moved here because you saw the quality of life, low taxes, a safe community. It's not that safe anymore, folks. The quality of life is being ripped right away from us. I grew up just about 10 minutes east of here, west of here, in Conway. I grew up with a mom who worked three jobs. I grew up poor. But I set off to college and I became a missionary to serve the poor, to serve the oppressed, the people who were in need of help. And our city's in need of help right now. So, and I want to thank the senior citizens and the people who retired because it's because of you. It's you that built this country, that created the fabric of who we are today as a people. Hard work, stability, faith in God, love of family and the protection of our community. That's what this election is about. We've lost our way of community here. We lost our way because our streets are not safe. Drugs, prostitution, corruption has barnstormed our city. And that's not fair. It's up to you and I to make that change. We are the change. And at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, whatever your decision is on Tuesday, November 7th, please go vote. Whomever you vote for, please vote for public safety. We must preserve and protect our community at all costs. And I hope that at the end of this election, that this campaign that I've run um, has been based on serving you in the best interest of our community. I ask for your prayers. I humbly ask for your vote. Please vote for Keith Van Winkle on Tuesday, November 7th. I promise you, I'm not asking you to trust me. I'm asking you to believe in me as I believe in each and every one of us right here. Because we are a family, a community, and together we can change the course and direction that we're on. Thank you and God bless. The later question was uh, senior citizens and safety. What we need and is what we keep harping on is that we need more officers on the street, especially in the neighborhoods, back in each community, back in the retirement communities. They come here wanting to live out a good life, and uh, I think our current council and mayor have failed that, and we're left to clean it up. That's what I intend to do. And I hope you vote for, for me on November 7th. But we need to ensure your safety so you can enjoy the retirement. Thanks. Uh, that concludes our debate. Uh, if you would, uh, I'll stand up and I would like to give these, uh, all six of these folks that showed up for our debate. A big round of applause.